Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm, I'm sure it has happened, but but on a more mainstream course, there's still a lot of studies being done because you know you need time. But so far, there's very very little spoilage. Of course, there's no corkage. Um, there's yeah. there's no TCA or anything like that that goes into the wine that can go wrong. Now, some people really enjoy just the the act of, of popping a cork, you know, because you're celebrating and and you know you really enjoy that, but. Uh, especially in, in restaurants, you know, a screw top is so much easier for the wait staff than having to oh, get a corkscrew. And then, you know, you get servers and they're, they're new. Everyone was new at some point in time. You break a cork and then you're embarrassed and you're trying to pull it out. And you need, yeah. you know, you screw tops tips. are so much easier and, the, you know, they're airtight. So, so yes, over a long period of time, the wine isn't going to get the little tiny amounts of oxygen that a cork would allow through mm -hmm. um, to kind of change how wine ages over 30 or 40 years. But some wines, they want you to drink them in the next five to 10 years. Okay, but these tops are completely fine. So these aren't meant to be aged 50 years. These are, no, drink I, it now. I if you kept you, it for a year or two, you're okay. Yeah, I don't think you're going to see Sasakaya coming out with screw tops or mm -hmm. Opus One coming out with screw tops anytime <laughs> well, that'd soon. That would be hilarious. That would be a big to do. But, uh, but I, do, I do think that a lot of wineries, especially that are focused on on premise and just ease of consumption, you know, if you're taking it to the beach or you're taking it out on your deck, you just want to, just, crack the cap and you're good to go and they mm. taste great well real fast before we switch wines i want to tell everybody about fresh uh this was the the prosecco we picked today to enjoy our lovely saint patty's day celebration um it's one of their newer uh varietals that they just put out they did put it in this lovely glass bottle i love this yeah. mm -hmm. you there's uh, so many crafty people out there that have put you know lights in these bottles and the light actually reflects off and it just makes like a mm -hmm. A disco. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's really cool. So they are making these now into little minis. Oh, cute. So that'll oh, be kind of cute. fun for people if they're wanting to have for bridal showers and mm -hmm. weddings and things like that. Yeah. But this is our Fresnet Prosecco, and we are going to move on to red for our next mix. Okay. All right, Evan, what are we drinking? So this is Palazzo Della Torre from Allegrini. This is one of their most famous wines. Allegrini is one of the most famous wineries in the Veneto region of Italy. One of the misconceptions and wine myths that we were, you know, we're talking about, we're bouncing around ideas was that all good wine has to be expensive. And that's just absolutely not true. There's a lot of really, really great valued wines out there that mm -hmm. aren't very expensive at all. So this bottle in local stores around you usually goes for around $20. Uh, and it's, it's just an excellent, an excellent bottle of wine. Uh, the concept behind this, Allegrini is essentially the gold standard for Amarone production in Italy. They make some of the best Amarone, they are world renowned for it. But unfortunately, people like myself, yeah, I can't buy an $80 bottle of Amarone on a Tuesday night right. after work when I feel I'd like drinking. To. They sympathize with the rest of the world in that problem and they decided to scale back their production a little bit on, on some things and create kind of a lighter wine in the style of Amarone that was far less expensive. So this still is based on the Corvina grape with a few others. It still uses a slight drying method where they dry the grapes on straw mats and then blend it in with the fresh grapes from the next harvest. Really? Uh, so you still get some of those herbal raisin qualities on here. Mm -hmm. This yeah. wine itself, the Plaza del Torre, has been on Wine Spectator's top 100 list more than any other wine. Wine in more than any other Italian wine in history. It's been on six really? times. Wow. Yep. And the, uh, the the winemaker, Marilisa Allegrini, is 11th or 12th generation winemaking. Um, their, their winery is an old Italian castle that sits in the Veneto. I, I have to say, really quick, I yeah. love that about Italian wineries, you know, especially because they always have, like, I am the 12th generation, or I am the 6th yeah. generation, or I am. Yeah. It's in the. And most Italian wineries, they know each other and or are related. Yeah. Like they yep. married, oh, oh, my sister's married to the guy from over here and yeah. his cousin's married to that one. And yeah. it's, it's super cool and such rich tradition and rich mm -hmm. history. She's a rock star. She's world famous. She was the first Italian winemaker, the first female Italian winemaker to ever be on the cover of Wine Spectator completely by herself really? last year. Yeah. Yep. She's just an absolute rock star. But, you know, they're also modern and they understand that, listen, just because the way we made Italian wine in the 18th century was really famous doesn't mean it's going to work today. Right. And so they're changing for modern people. So this is a really great example of really good wine for right around $20 that still delivers mm -hmm. a lot of quality. Yeah. It's lovely. It's gorgeous. And I think that's mm -hmm. a, a good a good myth to bust because there are so many wines. Um, you don't have to spend a tremendous amount you know, it, I think we've said this so many, many, many times, just try the wines. Yeah. You know, you just got to try them. And you go to your store and you ask your local owners, your store owners, to recommend based on what you're cooking or what you're doing, and they will help you out. But yeah. that, that's the best way to do it is just to go try. Go to wine festivals, go to wine tastings, mm -hmm. go to wine dinners, try what you like, buy yeah. what you like, mm -hmm. you know. 
you could give someone who loves drinking twenty dollar wines a three thousand dollar bottle of wine, and they might be like, "This tastes awful," because they yeah. don't, they don't know, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, you know, it's it's try things, try different things, and see what you like, and see what your style is. It's right. the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and bust uh, uh, another myth on reds. Okay. All right. Is it that they give you headaches? That would be it. Yeah. Uh, I we we get it so many. I'm sorry, I can't do red wines. It gives me a headache. I used to get a lot of headaches from drinking wine. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'm just going to tell everybody out there, I was not drinking enough water. And they are severe migraines. You get them like you want to kill yourself. You pretty much do. But one of the biggest things is that people really do not realize. And, and red wine, white wine, rosé, wine is extremely dehydrating. Did you want to get that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, photographer extraordinaire, but he, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you're gonna go back to drinking water. Yeah, uh, yeah, one of the things when I used to get my headaches was I was not drinking enough water because I didn't realize, you know, when you are drinking one glass of red wine, it's an equivalent to, and I, I don't know the exact, maybe you do because you're, you know, an expert in all things. But <laughs> don't sign me up for that. Yeah, exactly. I'm just gonna <laughs> throw the, did, you, did you feel that bus come right over there? I did. But it's it's equivalent. You're having so many, you know, several different beers, or it's equivalent to having, you know, a, a stronger cocktail. You're not just having a glass of this is this is not just grape juice with a little bit of alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of alcohol in here, yeah. which is severely dehydrating. Yeah. So please make sure to drink. You're supposed to drink one glass of water for every glass of red or any wine. Mm -hmm. I find for me, ever since I started doing that, I do not have headaches. Well, why does it seem, though, mm -hmm. that it's worse with reds than it is it's with wine? It's is more dehydrating. Is it, the, it, it, it's, it is more dehydrating. I mean, it, it, I believe it is. I, it, your body also responds differently to yeah. different alcohols. You know, I have friends that could drink half a bottle of tequila, and they're completely fine, and it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, right. it's, your body just responds differently yeah. to different yeah. alcohols, and everyone's body responds differently. If you drink more of something, your body's going to acclimate a little bit better to that thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, you, I mean, there's, there's the same amount of sulfites in a glass of wine, roughly, this isn't exact, mm -hmm. but as it, there are in like a banana or a couple eggs. Exactly. Or like that, you're, yeah. If you're allergic to sulfites, you're allergic to every alcohol. And that, is the, that mm -hmm. is the big consensus that they will tell you. There's a lot of articles you can read on the internet that will tell you this. But if you're large, you, you know, alcohol is created by making the, the yeast is eating the, um, you know, the sugars mm -hmm. to create the alcohol. In order to do that, that's your sulfates. Yeah. So you have to have sulfates in order to have any type of alcohol. And the, and the biggest thing that goes into hangovers and things is, is the sugar in the it's wine. The it's really sugar gives you the bigger, the bigger hangover than anything else. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so if you're drinking sweet wine, if you're drinking... Uh, cocktails with sugary mixers mm. in them and things yeah. like that. Your hangover is going to be far worse than if you're drinking dry wine. Yeah. Well, you, okay. I also hear people say, when I was in Europe, I never had a problem with headaches. Well, and, and I'm going to also bust that myth just okay. a little bit. Because, yeah, when you're in Europe, when I, I lived in Italy for three years, when I was there, I never had a glass of wine without eating and or drinking mm. water. Because... The Italians especially. Oh, you can't just have wine. It's not wine. <laughs> right. You, you don't just have a glass of wine. You have a meal, and the wine is like saying, oh, I had a Coke with dinner. It's, to them, it is just part of the meal. It enhances mm -hmm. your meal. So you're eating a whole bunch. And you know, you're, you're eating. Every time you're drinking, you're eating. Yeah. You're so your eating. Food, your body's absorbing it with the food. Whereas mm -hmm. in America, it's like a lot of times you're having two glasses of wine this on is my your dinner, stomach right? or without yeah. food. And that's going to play a big role in yeah. it as well. That makes sense. So we've busted uh, a few myths. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a few. Th There's uh, some stories, though, Evan promised us. Yeah. So, so when I heard we were talking about myths and we were, when we were starting with sparkling wine, I, I was told Nick, I said, oh, like Dom Perignon. And she, she was like, oh, I, I, yeah, we could talk about that a little bit. Because there's a lot of myths that surround Don Perignon about, like, the first time he tried champagne, he said, oh, I've drank the stars. You need to come and try this. There's zero record of that until marketing started in, like, the 19th century. And all of a sudden, that's that a quote good story. Yeah. It's a great story. It's a, it's a great quote. I, I would like to say that every time I drink champagne. Um, or that his job was to get rid of the bubbles in champagne because, they, you know, they didn't understand why it was there and what was happening. <clears throat> That's not true either, or that he was blind, or he definitely wasn't blind. Um, what, what he was, was, you know, back during his time, they didn't really fully understand champagne. They would harvest the grapes in the summertime, and then they would ferment them over the fall, and then they would put them in bottles in the cellar while they fermented, and then it would get really cold in the wintertime, you know, 
Europe is, is much further north than we are, much colder in the wintertime. And then in the spring, the, the fermentation hadn't finished yet. So there were still dead yeast cells or excuse me, live yeast cells and sugar in the bottle. So the temperatures would rise and the yeast would reactivate and start fermenting again. And all of a sudden the bottles would start exploding in the basement and they keep all the bottles, you know, space was limited. So all the bottles were together. So they were little mini bombs going off. And when one of them goes off, 10 of them go off and they were losing all this money. So they're like, we need, we need you to figure out what's going on here and how do we fix this? One of the solutions they came up with is actually thanks to the British. Mm -hmm. uh, the British had a process in which they could make thicker glass. Mm -hmm. So the glass could withstand that secondary fermentation. Um, so that helped keep the bubbles and push the bubbles back into the wine to create the carbonation that goes into champagne. One of the other things that Dom Perignon was really famous for uh, was blending, the blending of the juices prior to the fermentation. He was one of the first people to do that. Um, he was a little bit of a purist in, in what he decided to do, and that helped create some of the blends of champagne that we have to now with the Pinot Noir and the Pinot Meunier mm -hmm. and the Chardonnay. Um, so he was the first. Wow. Yeah, he was. I don't know if he was the first. Back when you go back that far, it's hard to get sure. records of like who did it. But he was probably the biggest advocate early on of like you know because a lot of people were fermenting the juices and then blending them afterwards. And he was like, we end up with a much higher quality of champagne if we blend the still table wine first. And then we do the second fermentation in the bottle with these new glass bottles we have. And yeah, he, he, was, he was very, very important in the role of champagne, but not for a lot of the reasons that people think it's important. So. <laughs> Myths busted. Yeah. Myths busted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, thank you, Evan, so much for coming. Thank you for having me. For um, busting some myths with us and bringing really good wine. Yeah. Uh, he kind of sprung some wine on us. He said, what do you want? And this is what I told him, and he brought this really good wine, so thank you so much yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, next month, we have the Gwen Surprise. It's a challenge. The Gwen Yay. Surprise Box, where Carolyn and I are picking the ingredients out. Gwen does not know about them yet. She will be cooking a surprise meal from some, of some sort out of the ingredients yeah. we've picked, and then we will be pairing wine with it. Mm -hmm. We have invited people to come in and enjoy the meal. They won't be picking the ingredients, but they will be enjoying the meal. So please hit us up if you want to be one of those participants. Yep. We'd love to have you. How about some events coming up? What do oh, we have? Gosh, in March, what do we have <laughs> happening? Well, we have our Prohibition dinner I'm so excited Ooh, about. Yeah. Dressing up, doing yeah, that. We're doing a Prohibition our, dinner. It's our monthly couples in the kitchen class. It, the theme is the speakeasy mm -hmm. theme. Uh, oh, that sounds month. like fun. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's going to be a blast. Mm -hmm. And you guys are doing Wine 101 classes now here. Um, I believe, right? Yes, yes. Um, in actually in March. Actually, it, mm -mm. Mm -mm. It'll be it's all going to be in answer. April. Yeah. Oh, oh, over yeah. by then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we are doing well. The biggest thing in April is we'll have our champagne showcase. We are bringing yes. it back this year, um, and I'm partnering with a couple of other ladies in the shopping center to really take it up and make it almost a girls' mm -hmm. day. So we take over the store. We have eight vendors that come in, and they will talk about everything that has to do with sparkling wines. Um, and the cocktails that you can make with it. Right. So that will be the first Friday of April, um, as well as Heather from the jewelry store will be partnering with us um, from Martin's Jewelry. Right. And uh, she'll have some sort of a ladies' day as well. So okay. that's so, our biggest thing. Yep, mm -hmm. so that is April. That's the first, first Friday. First Friday in April. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got some exciting things, and I hope you guys are able to join us in April. Please let us know in the comments below. Make sure that you go ahead and also hit the thumbs up because you want to like our videos, please like our videos. Share, Share them. <laughs> and subscribe. Just do it all. Just do it all. Mm -hmm. Like, subscribe, and share, please. Mm -hmm. yes. Subscribe. Yes. subscribe. Please subscribe to the videos. Uh, we It does help us, and hopefully we'll be able to get out to a winery soon and do some filming outside. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. You guys.